So it's the evening before opening day. It's like nine o'clock at night. It's been crappy weather all day. Sun suddenly pops out and so do the bears. In like 15 minutes, we've seen three bears all within probably a mile or two. And it's like I said, not even day one technically yet. There are many reasons why you might not want to live in Alaska. And most of those reasons have to do with the fact that if you like being alive, well, Alaska is a pretty dangerous place. But if you ask me, I think it's more important to focus on what your interpretation of the word alive is. You see, for me, the very things that make Alaska dangerous also make me feel like I'm living. The great Ernest Hemingway wrote, don't you ever get that feeling that all your life is going by and you're not taking full advantage of it? Well, usually I would probably say yes that I agree with that. That is, except for when I'm in Alaska. Because when I'm here, dangers be damned. Alaska makes me feel alive. Hello, Alaska! Come true. Well, Nick, how you doing back there? Let me give you two good reasons why I love Alaska. The first is that there are more licensed pilots in Alaska than any other state in the U.S. And being a pilot myself, I really like airplanes. The second is that Alaska is a sportsman's paradise. There are moose and sheep and deer and bear. Lots of really big bears. I'm talking about the Alaskan brown bear. And this trip is going to combine both of those things. My journey begins when I board a big jet in Nashville, Tennessee, and end up in Anchorage, Alaska. From there, I hop on a much smaller plane, which takes me down the Alaskan Peninsula to the village of Cold Bay. And it's here that I connect with my friend and outfitter, Brad Salsa. Brad has operated Alaska Wilderness Charters and Guiding for over 30 years. And he's also an accomplished bush pilot. And he wastes no time loading me up into his little super cub so we can begin our journey into the backcountry. Let the adventures begin. Airborne in Alaska, baby. Here we go. It. I love it. Pretty awesome place to hunt brown bear down here. Does this ever get old for you? No, it doesn't. I guess the excitement is you just never know how big a bear you're going to get. I mean, the possibility of getting a 10 and a half, 11 foot bear it can't be realistic down here. Yeah. Nowhere else in the world would you have an opportunity to kill a 11 foot bear. Right. Well, when it comes to brown bears, it sounds like I've come to the right place, and lucky for me, that is exactly what I'm here for. North America is home to about 55,000 brown bears. Western Canada has about 25,000 of them, and the United States has about 30,000. The lower 48 is home to just a few thousand in the states of Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and Washington, and the rest of them all live in Alaska. Brown bears in North America are split into three subspecies, but basically it boils down to grizzlies and brown bears. The grizzlies all live inland, and the brown bears live in coastal areas. And the Alaskan brown bear is split into two subspecies, the peninsula brown bear and the Kodiak brown bear, which is the biggest of them all. Basically, the old saying goes that all grizzly bears are brown bears, but not all brown bears are grizzly bears. Hunting the peninsula brown bear is a famously dangerous and nasty exercise, one that is definitely not for the weak or faint of heart. Now, it's one thing to be a hunter out here for a week or two at a time, but it's a completely different one to be an outfitter and pilot out here for 30 plus years. What's the hardest part about being an outfitter out here? Probably the weather is the hardest part. Flying in the conditions, there is no worse place in Alaska to fly than this area that we're in. Yeah. The southern part of the Alaska Peninsula has absolutely the worst weather in Alaska. Last fall, we had winds 50 to 80 miles an hour almost every single day of the fall hunting season. Oh yeah, welcome to welcome to Cold Bay, Nick. Oh. You're, uh, you're, you're in store for the shittest weather of all time. Yeah, great, that's awesome. But the rewards are incredible. Weather and flying go hand in hand and are as intertwined as farming and rain. And the same goes for the great state of Alaska and the bush plain. As Brad said, the weather here can be nasty. And it's not only not fun to fly in bad weather, it can be downright dangerous. 
but such is the way of the Alaskan bush pilot. Most of Alaska is only accessible by airplane, which means most of Alaska was hardly touched by humans until the very first bush planes started flying here in the 1920s and 30s. But from the very start of Alaskan aviation, it became quickly clear that flying in Alaska was not like flying anywhere else. The mountains and the weather proved a worthy adversary, as is proven by the many pilots that have perished doing what they love in the Alaskan backcountry. But it's those same extremes that make the bush pilots of the Alaskan Peninsula some of the very best pilots in all of the world. And considering the conditions, thanks to pilots like Brad, they have an incredible safety record. Lucky for us, the weather today is pretty darn good. The visibility is almost perfect, which allows me to get my very first glance of what I came here for. There's a bear over there. Oh yeah. Oh, here's those here's two. Here's two more over here. Oh, look at that. Wow. That is definitely right there. That's the first brown bear I've ever seen in the wild right there. Is it? Yep. And we're just like what? We're two miles from camp? Yeah, we're just <laughs> setting up on uh, final here. Yeah, getting ready to land. They're, they're heading towards camp, actually. Oh, that's slightly scary. That's like four brown bears two miles from camp. Yeah. Yeah, baby. I've been thinking about this moment for like five years, ever since I met Brad. And now that I'm here at base camp, it's everything that I could have expected. You see bears on the way in, it's beautiful, snow-covered mountains. But one thing that I wasn't expecting though is the Let's Go Brandon flag. It's an interesting touch. What's the deal with the flag? Uh, this is a Let's Go Brandon camp. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. It's your camp. <laughs> it's my camp, and Brandon lives strong in this camp. <laughs> yeah, we don't really care about uh, the snowflakes here in this camp, unless they're falling out of the sky. Right? That's the only time we care about snowflakes. <laughs> after I got the lowdown on where Brad sits politically, and after the baked beans and the burgers were eaten, I asked him what his stance was on nightcaps, which, after the long journey I've had, I was definitely a little too excited about. I'm literally sitting here watching this like a baby is about to be born. That's kind of pathetic, isn't it? Here's to a good hunt. Yeah. Cheers. There you go. Good luck, guys. Cheers. To Alaska. To Alaska. After spending my first night on the Alaskan Peninsula in a base camp, it was time to say goodbye to the Let's Go Brandon flag and take one more plane ride into the mountains to Spike Camp. And just like that, I'm finally in hunting camp. Let the games begin. I have literally been dreaming about this moment for years. I know I said that at base camp, but this is the moment I've been waiting for. Literally, your tech clock. Hello, it's where Alaska. Dreams come true. <laughs> What's that? It's where dreams come true, Jeff. Dreams come true. Alaska has always offered the allure of dreams coming true. The Alaskan gold rush took place from 1896 until 1898, and in that short period, over 100,000 prospectors were looking for their dreams to come true in Alaska in search of gold. There is a lot of story to tell there, but to keep it short, a lot of people lost their lives, most lost their fortunes, and only a few actually made a fortune. And of those few that did strike it rich, most of them ended up in poverty. The bottom line to this story is that every one of those people chased their dreams and came to Alaska searching for fortune and to feel alive. But the reality of the situation is that most went home empty handed or didn't make it home at all. Now I find myself in a similar situation, chasing down a dream that if I'm not careful, could kill me. And that might be the reason that if you want to hunt brown bear in Alaska, you have to have a licensed and certified guide. And as soon as I landed in camp, I met mine. Meet Jeff Tart. Most of the year, Jeff lives in Montana with his wife and kids, but he's also a former Army infantry officer who proudly served in the U.S. Army as a scout platoon leader in Bosnia in 1996. So if you ask me, he's a true American hero. Needless to say, I'm in good hands. Jeff and I spend the day getting to know each other. And then in the evening, we begin scouting, trying to get a jump start for opening day tomorrow. And things got off to a great start. 
So it's the evening before opening day. It's like nine o'clock at night. It's been crappy weather all day. The sun suddenly pops out and so do the bears. In like 15 minutes, we've seen three bears all within probably a mile or two. And it's like I said, not even day one technically yet. So it's like 6.30, we've been spotting for, I don't know, an hour and a half. Had a little breakfast, little coffee, come out here. Looking around, looking around, boom, big bear. So now we're trying to decide whether or not it's a sow. There's a smaller bear that's with it, but we're not sure if it's a cub or not. If it's a big boar, it's a shooter. It's a good sign. In Alaska, it is legal to shoot sow brown bears as long as they don't have cubs with them. As a rule, boars are larger than sows, and the fact that these two bears are together with no cubs tells us that they might be beginning the mating ritual, which will lead up to the mating season, which begins in a month or so. Once we got a good look at that boar, we decided to make a move. And by making a move, I mean crossing rivers, navigating uneven tundra, and climbing up a mountain. But for every step we took, the bears took another, and as the evening set in, it became clear that today was not gonna be the day. What a bummer. So that's the bear that we saw yesterday. And yesterday we weren't sure if it was a sow with cubs or a boar with a sow. Now we know it's a boar with a sow. And he just walked out of our dreams. At least we're in the game. Bear two. Nick Zero. The year is 1942, and in response to the threat of Japan capturing the Aleutian Islands and Alaska, General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. ordered a military airbase to be built. It was to protect the only deep water port in the area. Dutch Bay, and with that, the village of Cold Bay, Alaska was born. In its heydays of the military base, Cold Bay had a population of hundreds. Now it's closer to 50 people who are not only mostly isolated out here, but also endure some pretty nasty weather that is cloudy over 300 days of the year. Cold Bay does, however, offer a wonderland for outdoorsmen to experience. With some of the best salmon fishing in Alaska, excellent waterfowl populations, and miles of untamed wilderness to be hunted, which is right up my alley. Now about 50 miles outside of Cold Bay, I find myself with my new friend and guide Jeff Tart chasing around the mountains after a boar and a sow for the second day in a row. Yesterday, we couldn't get close at all. Today, the opposite is happening. We're gonna go slow till we get into the yellow grass. And then once we get up to the willow line, we'll stop and refine them again. Yeah. Perfect. You think it's born us out? I think it's born us out. Yeah. As we move closer to them, they feed closer to us. And eventually we decide that we need to sit tight and make a stand. And the waiting game begins. After several hours of painful waiting, this giant boar and his female companion are 75 yards away, but this area is so thick and nasty that it's impossible to get a clear shot. And I'm officially addicted to brown bear hunting. That did it. We ended up 75 yards away, maybe closer. At one point, they were down in the brush and we totally lost sight of them and ended up backing out because the wind started swirling. And all I could think about was that at any given point in time, this giant brown bear could just walk out of those alders that were in front of us 15, 20 yards away, which is all at once totally exciting and completely insane. And I love it. Maybe that makes me insane. They call it the last frontier, and the more time I spend in Alaska, I believe it's true. It's the kind of place that you can't understand until you experience it for yourself. The hard truth is that being here, and the very act of just getting here, 
is dangerous. And that's probably the reason that for people like my guy, Jeff Tart, Alaska gets in your blood and just doesn't leave. What does it take to be a guide out here? It's a love of taking people out uh, and experiencing the outdoors with them and showing people a beauty uh, that maybe they don't get to see. There are a lot of guys and gals yeah. that are very good hunters. Um, they're very good. Their field craft is good. Shooting skills are good. They're in physically good condition. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make a very good God. It's almost a return to like a primal existence. Yeah. It's a very basic existence, and I enjoy that. Yeah. There's so much, I think, that we miss because we're so busy. Um, and out here, you really, uh, you're almost forced to slow down. Yeah. And then you start noticing things that you had never noticed before. And it's pretty awesome. What's the worst part about being a guide? You want people to come in, harvest a nice animal, have a great experience, but it's not always that way. It's yeah. just most of the time, actually, it's, it's very difficult. The hardest part, I think, is adjusting to the different types of people that come. I bet. And because you've got that variable coupled with the weather, and coupled with animal movement, then there are things that are just outside of your control. I yeah. mean, things break, people get sick. And so it's dealing with all those variables and then staying in that positive mental, that, that positive mental place. You can get sucked into the negative out here very quick. The job is not just killing, it's the experience. It's taking people out and showing them. That afternoon, Jeff and I continued that experience as we spent hours glassing, which paid off because eventually we spotted a board not too far from camp. It didn't take us very long to close the distance, and once I got set up, I got the feeling that this was the moment that I had come all this way for, the moment I get my shot at an Alaskan brown bear. And then Jeff whispers something that I couldn't believe I was hearing. I think he's big as I first thought he was. Are you serious? Yeah. I think he's a solid eight and a half foot. I mean, he's beautiful, dude. I don't think it's what you're looking for. When you think of Alaska, you think big bold, vast, but if you ask me, words can't really accurately describe what Alaska feels like. And one of my favorite parts about this kind of hunt in this kind of place is that you get to spend hours glassing. You spend days getting to know every nook and cranny of this huge place. And suddenly it starts to feel accessible and smaller. And then you find a bear and a second one and a third one and you become intimately in touch with the fact that this vastness is alive. And then you repeat that day after day, and you do that until you find what you're looking for, which is exactly what happened on day number eight when we found the boar and the sow that we had come so close to days before. And this time, they gave us the show of a lifetime. Yes, in case you're wondering, I'm pretty sure what you're seeing here would best be defined as some sort of rough foreplay, or at bare minimum, the equivalent of heavy petting. Nice, man. Holy. Well done, brother. <laughs> and in an instant, just like that, my hunt is over. And I become yet another notch in Alaska's belt of people who have come here seeking adventure despite the many dangers and leave feeling alive. <gasps> He's laying right there on the side of the hill. <laughs> Alaska does something to the people who come here. And I'm not just talking about the wrinkles it puts on people's faces or the calluses it puts on their hands. 
It does something to people's souls, and it's been doing it for centuries. People like Brad Salsa, who despite the dangers, have been flying the Alaskan skies for over 30 years. And people like Jeff Tart, who have dedicated their lives to making sure that people like me get to feel what he feels. When you add up the climbing of the mountains, the crossing of the rivers, the days of glassing, the wind, the rain, the snow, and the days of eating dried food, most people would probably think that you'd end up in the negative, but not for me. No, that's a math problem that ends in nothing but positive. Going back to what old man Hemingway said, don't you ever get the feeling that all your life is going by and you're not taking advantage of it? Yeah, sometimes I do, but not today.